I'm going to begin. It'll take us a few minutes uh, before we get to the main attraction of the of the afternoon. So as people roll in, um, we'll welcome them. And I'd like to welcome everybody. Hope you're all healthy. Um, for those that aren't, we hope that you're getting better. Uh, we express our deepest condolences for those of you who have lost people during this terrible epidemic, pandemic. Uh, and I also, uh, we also always like to thank the doctors, the nurses, the hospital personnel, and other frontline responders who are working um, at peril during these very serious and dangerous times. So thank you. Um, we are hopeful that providing these uh, programs, uh, by providing these programs, we are helping to preserve some sense of hope and optimism. Uh, we feel that being informed and engaged is essential for the preservation of our democracy. Tonight's program is the result of a joint venture between Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. For those who aren't familiar, Judge Jews United is a collaboration formed earlier in this president's administration when a sizable number of people in the Los Angeles Jewish community felt that our American and Jewish values were under siege. The leadership of Judge is comprised of former Congressman Mel Levine, legendary LA civic leader who you see next to me, Xavier Slavsky, attorney Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chazen of Leo Beck Temple, and David Lehrer. David is not only a member of the Judge Executive Committee, but he is also the founder of our partner organization, Community Advocates, Inc., an organization committed to civil discourse and the preservation of democracy. David is a former longtime regional director of the Anti-Defamation League, and he's been an incredible partner in this venture. He's the key force in the development of this lecture series, and we're very grateful to you, David. You will hear a word from David at the end of our program. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors in this program, Leo Beck Temple, Valley Beth Shalom, Ikar, Stephen Wise Temple, Temple Israel of Hollywood, The Forward, a Jewish Center for Justice, um, and of course the two organizations who are founded the series. This virtual series started off with five programs featuring renowned journalists and thinkers. At our last webinar, we announced that Congressman Adam Schiff was added to the series, and that's next week, a week from tonight. We know that you have, we, we know that this will be an incredible evening, and the whole series is very exciting. We also have another very exciting addition to the series that David will announce at the end of the program. You can register for all programs, through the links that we have provided on the flyer, and you'll get another one tonight. Be sure to register for next week's program with Congressman Schiff. We'd also like to thank our donors who have helped to make these programs possible. If you would like to help uh, underwrite these programs, just contact me. You can chat me, uh, you can uh, contact me through this webinar's chat function, and I will respond to you privately. Uh, we have many hundreds of people attending this webinar, which speaks to both the eagerness of our community to stay informed and engaged, and of course, to the quality of the speakers and programs we are presenting. Each of these virtual programs will be available on our YouTube channel, and within the next day or two, you will receive the link to be able to access that and share it with your friends who are unable to be with us tonight. Now I'd like to introduce Zev, who really needs no introduction, for, but I will make a short one. For four decades, Zev has served the city and county of Los Angeles as one of our most prominent leaders. Now he directs Los Angeles Initiative at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and the Department of History at UCLA, where he concentrates on the intersection of policy, politics, and history in our region. Uh, Zev. Thank you, Janice, uh, and welcome uh, to all of our viewers and listeners, and hope you're healthy and, uh, and well. Uh, this virtual lecture series has definitely been received with great enthusiasm. Uh, we had more than 800 people uh, attend our first virtual program last week, or a couple of weeks ago, and tonight there are more than uh, 1,000 people uh, expected in attendance. Uh, now every Wednesday, from, for the next seven weeks, you'll be able to join us to hear the best and the brightest uh, in our nation that speak to the issues that we are committed to. Next Wednesday at 5 p.m., uh, just to repeat, join us to hear Congressman Adam Schiff. Uh, be sure to register. The link has been provided and will be sent again immediately after tonight's webinar. And again, I want to thank uh, Janice Kamen Resnick and uh, David Lehrer uh, for their leadership in putting this together and the other things they do. It's my privilege to introduce uh, tonight's moderator, uh, Nick Goldberg. 
Uh, Nick is a graduate of Harvard University, a, in, a majored in government. Uh, he's been with the Los Angeles Times for the past 18 years. In 2002, uh, he started editing the op-ed page at the paper and then the Sunday opinion section. Uh, and in 2008, he became the deputy editor of the editorial pages. And in 2009, was named the editor of the editorial pages, where he served for uh, the next 11 or 12 years. Uh, in 2020, just a few weeks ago, he became the op-ed columnist uh, for the, one of the op-ed columnists for the paper and associate editor for the Times. Uh, previously, Nick served for many years as a Middle East bureau chief and has also served as a political reporter. He has been widely published uh, in the Los Angeles Times, the New Republic, the New York Times, Vanity Fair, The Nation, the Sunday Times of London, Washington Monthly, an American lawyer, among others. Uh, on a personal note, I've known Nick for many years, dealt with him uh, in his capacity at the LA Times, and also on occasion seeing him while he's walking and I'm jogging in our neighborhood. So it's a privilege to uh, turn this over to Nick Goldberg. Zev, were you going to uh, introduce Brett? No, you are. Uh, okay, I was told you. Well, anyway, okay, then you. I will. I, I think I'm, I think you're right. I will. I will. I apologize. Uh, show business is not my strong suit. Um, let me also introduce uh, our special guest tonight, uh, 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 Brett Stevens, columnist for the New York Times. Uh, Brett was raised in Mexico City, educated at the University of Chicago and the London School of Economics. Uh, he began as an op-ed editor at the Wall Street Journal and he held a number of positions there. At 28 years of age, he became the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. And after a couple of distinguished years with the Jerusalem Post, Brett returned to the Wall Street Journal where he spent many years as a global affairs columnist. In 2013, while uh, at the Journal, uh, Brett was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for commentary for his incisive columns on American foreign policy and domestic politics, often enlivened by a contrarian twist. Uh, those were the words of the Pulitzer Committee. Uh, in April 2017, uh, Stevens left the journal and joined the New York Times as an opinion columnist. Uh, the following June, he began appearances as one uh, as an on-air commentator on NBC News and on M MSNBC. A fellow New York Times journalist wrote of Brett that he is deeply driven by principle, and even if the party that once reflected his principles shifts, he's unafraid to stick to the principles rather than the party. He's been an outspoken critic of the president, President Trump. In the past couple of years, have been have seen Stevens turn against Republican standard bearer with abandon. Uh, he has uh, he has compared Trump to the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. He has called Trump an unreliable narrator and a man who embarrasses or terrifies much of the world. Uh, we've had uh, Brett out to Los Angeles once before, and it's a privilege and an honor to have him with us again. So let me turn it over to Nick Goldberg and Brett Stevens. Thanks, Zev. You did a much better job than I would have done off the top of my head. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. I gather we can't see you, but I gather there are a lot of you out there. Um, I'm very excited to be here with Brett. Uh, tonight, you'll, you'll be shocked to hear we're going to talk about the exact same subject that no one has talked about anything else than for the last, uh, for the last two months, uh, but with any luck, we'll, we'll discuss it better. Uh, COVID-19 is, is, you know, one of, or perhaps the greatest crisis to face our country in our lifetimes. Uh, deaths in this country are already in excess of 70,000 people around, around the world were, were uh, approaching 300,000. Um, and we're currently trying to figure out what to do to, to reduce the spread, minimize fatalities, beat back the pandemic, and to do it without uh, growing, destroying our own economy and destroying the worldwide economy. Uh, as far as I can tell, we're not doing terribly well at, at that balancing act. Brett's new newspaper said today that uh, even as we begin to reopen the economy, we're living in a world of magical thinking, that we should be prepared for further outbreaks, that we should be prepared for a spread to rural areas, and we should be prepared for deaths in the 3,000 per day range in the weeks ahead. So we're really not, not out of the woods at all by any stretch, and life is unlikely to be back to, to normal in the near future. 
Uh, and that's the subject for tonight, at least for starters. What do we have to do to bring this under control? What do we have to do uh, to, to make life normal again? And what is normal life gonna be like after COVID? How are we gonna emerge from this? What can we expect in our politics, our culture, our society? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brett for, for a short introductory statement of a few minutes, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna ask him a bunch of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Well, Nick, thank you very much uh, to you and to Zev and to everyone uh, who uh, brought this event about. I'm honored, to, I'm honored to join you, and I'm honored to join everyone who's uh, participating uh, in the call. I should say, by way of preface, that um, uh, I am wearing pants, um, and, uh, uh, but I'm not wearing socks, since this is a, this is a California event, and I thought I'd keep, keep things in balance. Uh, I want to just say a few words briefly. Uh, five years ago, I wrote a book titled America in Retreat, uh, which contained a chapter that imagined the world in 2020. And uh, the world I imagined was a fairly dark place, uh, um, but it was not dark uh, uh, in quite the way that we've, we've discovered it to be. Um, I imagined that Hillary Clinton was going to uh, easily uh, win the elections against her Republican opponent, uh, Rand Paul. I imagined a series of uh, foreign policy crises in uh, the South China Sea. I imagined a, a nuclear balance of terror between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. I imagined uh, uprisings uh, in Iran that would threaten uh, the regime there in much the same way that the uprisings in Syria threatened the regime of, uh, of Bashar Assad. Uh, I thought that Russia might invade Belarus just as it had invaded uh, at least parts of, uh, parts of Ukraine. So when I read that chapter today, I do so with a uh, a little bit ruefully, um, but I think that that chapter still serves a purpose. Dwight Eisenhower once said that uh, plans, are, uh, uh, plans are useless, but planning is essential. And I would say that that remains uh, true uh, about uh, forecasting, that forecasts are useless, predictions are useless, but predicting as an intellectual exercise is essential. So I thought it might be worth thinking about where the world might be uh, in 2025, uh, five years hence, just as I had uh, tried to do back in, uh, back in uh, 2015. Where might COVID take us? Where might the crises that COVID, uh, 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 COVID is going to lead us, where might those crises uh, take us? One of the things that I have noted is that just as often authoritarianism breeds disease, just as China's refusal to get information out quickly and transparently about COVID is what helped um, uh, spread uh, this, uh, this virus as far and wide uh, as it has uh, spread. The reverse of that proposition, uh, Nick, is, is, is also true, which is that disease um, might spread authoritarianism. We have seen in Hungary, we have seen in Poland, uh, efforts to use the public health emergency in order to consolidate uh, authoritarian uh, uh, emergency rule. I worry that we might see the vast expansion of surveillance powers taken uh, in the name of, uh, of public health emergencies. Uh, we might see those surveillance powers also used to curtail civil liberties, uh, not only in authoritarian countries like uh, China, where that already happens, uh, but in democratic, uh, in democratic countries uh, as well. I worry that the economic ramifications of this crisis, uh, of this public health crisis, as serious as the health ramifications are, the economic ramifications might exceed uh, in seriousness, in gravity, in consequence, what we are experiencing from uh, COVID alone. Uh, there's a saying, I, you mentioned that I grew up in Mexico City. When I was growing up, there was a saying in the country that when the United States catches cold, Mexico catches pneumonia. So it's worth thinking about what happens when America catches COVID-19, what happens to the rest of the world, not least our neighbors like, uh, uh, like Mexico. I worry that we might see as a result both of the public health measures, but also the economic fallout that uh, an American depression is going to lead to a uh, global depression. And that is going to have 
uh, the most far-reaching and the most devastating consequences in countries that were already uh, vulnerable uh, to the effects of a, of a global slowdown. What might that mean in terms of global migration flows when a country like Mexico, which was already not growing at all, goes into a steep uh, depression? What might that mean in terms of the politics in Europe today? Some people might have noticed the headline that the, United, that, that the European Union is facing its deepest economic uh, crisis in history. What does that mean geopolitically, Nick? One of the aspects of geopolitics that I think is, is uh, fairly consistent is that uh, economic uh, periods of economic strain tend to make democracies risk averse. But economic strain often makes uh, autocracies, dictatorships, risk prone. So what might our uh, economic emergencies now or the ones we are, we are heading towards mean in terms of the uh, calculations of risk taken by uh, those who want to overturn uh, the world order and those who are uh, supposed to uh, defend it. All of this leads me to uh, a very gloomy forecast. And that is this, and I hope I'm wrong and I'd love to be convinced to the contrary. Uh, people have spoken frequently about how 2020 is another 1918 in the reach of the pandemic, uh, potentially equaling in, uh, in scope, if not perhaps in fatalities, the reach of the Spanish flu from 1918. Now we're looking also at another year, 1929, a great crash a Great Depression happening not only in the United States, but throughout the world. My question to you um, is whether we might not add a third date to that, and that's 1933. 1933 is a pregnant date because it was the year um, not only in which Franklin Roosevelt became uh, president, but it's of course the year in which uh, Adolf, uh, Adolf uh, Hitler became uh, the Chancellor of Germany. So. Uh, this is the frightful future that uh, has been preying on my mind. Now, I am prone to that wonderful uh, Woody Allen line that it's always darkest before it goes absolutely black. So what I'm hoping we can do in our conversation is um, maybe you can convince me or I can convince myself or um, some of the uh, participants on that call can do the job to uh, work us out of this uh, bleak scenario that I have uh, laid out for you. But as I said, even though predictions are useless, predicting is, is important. And I think that's, that's what behooves us to do now. Thank you. Uh, that was indeed bleak and gloomy. And, and we're just getting started. <laughs> uh, before we, um, before we, we go deep into the substance, I thought I would start just by asking you a couple of human interest questions. I, I'm curious, where you are, what your life is like, you know, are you, are you sheltering in New York, who are you with, and are you, uh, you know, are you feeling trapped and depressed, or are you feeling productive and exhilarated? I've actually spent a productive number of weeks, uh, uh, just because, um, uh, uh, well, to answer your question, I'm speaking from my apartment in lower Manhattan. Uh, I'm here with my wife and our three children. Uh, a couple of my kids uh, should be in their respective boarding schools uh, right now, but they were home for spring break when the lockdown orders uh, took place, which is uh, very fortunate that uh, uh, we were all we were all together when when this happened. Um, our our apartment sometimes feels like a small university in that there are classrooms taking place in nearly every room. One of the things I've been doing during this period is uh, teaching a seminar on political persuasion at the University of Chicago. I'd hope to do it in person, but I'm of course doing that uh, via Zoom uh, as well. And uh, I'm pretty much locked down except for, I try to I make an effort to get out of my home a couple of hours a day, uh, bike up uh, the Hudson River to, uh, to the George Washington Bridge and uh, uh, try to keep some, some, some sanity and perspective. New York is a very strange place. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of a Twilight Zone episode where at a distance things seem quite normal, but when you uh, look more closely, they are uh, anything but. All right, so, so you've, you've offered a pretty depressing vision 
of what the future could be like. And in the column that you wrote about uh, the view from 2025, uh, you talked about more authoritarianism, more Trump, a defeat for progressive policies, more crime, global financial collapse, the same stuff you've been talking about here. I don't, I'm not totally clear why that seems so inevitable to you. Isn't it possible that we'll come out of this with a renewed understanding, say, that science matters or that we shouldn't ignore problems that are barreling towards us until they hit us or that telecommuting can work or that some problems rise above uh, politics and that international cooperation is preferable to international antagonism. Uh, I mean, are these just pipe dreams and liberal fantasies? Well, yes. Uh, uh, look, uh, <laughs> Nick, look, uh, I obviously live in this world and I want things to go uh, well. I have elderly relatives who I care dearly about. Um, I am I'm obviously rooting for our health uh, and well-being. But there are um, limits to what you're suggesting. I mean, let's take something like telecommuting. Uh, about 35% of America can reasonably do much of its work. This is an estimate that I've seen can reasonably do much of its work uh, through means like the one we're employing now, through Zoom, on email, digitally, and so on. Huge swaths of the American economy just don't work that way. Um, and those are swaths that are typically on the lower uh, rungs of the economic spectrum. That is to say, the people who can least afford to lose their jobs are the ones uh, that are most likely uh, to lose them. Uh, secondly, you know, we have moved from 3.5% unemployment in the United States in February to 16.1% today, and it is still uh, plummeting. There are industries that are now on the brink of insolvency. Uh, uh, I just saw something about Hertz uh, just the other day, uh, the, the rental, uh, uh, car rental agency. Uh, you can imagine where the airlines are. So these sorts of economic ramifications are going to, I think, work their way through us, through the system, not just economically, but also socially. I'll give you a little anecdote. And of course, this is not data, uh, but this just is something that struck me very deeply. Someone I know who lives in, uh, uh, in Manhattan just got mugged for groceries. So when was the last time you remember something like that happening? People get mugged for their phones, people get mugged for uh, sometimes their cars or one thing or another, but for groceries, there is hunger in the United States on a massive scale, uh, or at least food insecurity on a massive scale of a sort that we've never seen before. And that tends to have social ramifications, it tends to have consequences in crime. I would like to think, to your last point, that we'll have a re renewed appreciation for uh, the scientific community and all that they do for us. And that's, that would be a, a, a great outcome. I think a lot of people feel grateful for people like Dr. Fauci and, and uh, Dr. Briggs and others who are kind of sensible voices uh, near the heart of power. Uh, but look at the protests that we're witnessing. I happen to be someone who's in favor of relaxing lockdowns in, 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 in various places. But right now you have a scientific community which is largely arguing in favor of um, a, a, a prescription, social prescriptions, which um, millions of Americans find intolerable. And I'm not quite sure that is going to lead to a renewed appreciation of what science can do for us. It might lead to the opposite. So again, this is very grim. And uh, I'm hoping that in the chat function or in the Q&A, someone gives me uh, a reason to, to think better of things, but that's where my mind is today. So, so yeah, you've been an advocate of reopening more quickly in, in some places than others, in far-flung counties that don't have many cases, in some states that are doing, doing better than other states. There may be no need to destroy the economy in order to save lives. But I'm curious whether you were chastened at all as I was, because I was starting to think some of that might be possible too, but I was very chastened by the lead story in the New York Times today that suggested that you know flare-ups are coming, that even though we haven't seen a lot of cases in rural, remote areas, they are coming, and that anyone who thinks, as you seem to think, that the threat is kind of fading or isn't as big in other places is, you know, is giving into magical thinking. Uh, no, I don't think that, just, just to be clear, 
um, we have to accept a balance of risk. We have to accept the likelihood that we are going to be living with COVID-19 for a very long time. We have to accept that there isn't a magical cure, a vaccine or an effective therapy uh, coming uh, right around the bend in the next uh, month or so. And we also have to accept that when we talk about economic ramifications, Nick, uh, the economy isn't some abstraction. The economy is uh, your ability to put food on uh, your family's table. The economy is uh, uh, being able to send your children to school. Uh, the economy is your mental health and people, uh, uh, that, is, that is also a public health issue. Um, the economy is feeling uh, that you have uh, health insurance and therefore making good decisions with your health uh, um, when, uh, when you have a job. So we have to come to some kind of appreciation that there should not be a one-size-fits-all solution, that the kind of uh, levels of infection that we see in a place like New York are not what we're going to see in a place like Texas, for example. Uh, and we have to balance the risks that COVID presents, which are real and serious, with the risks that lockdowns present, which are also real and serious. It's not one or the other. So, okay, I, I entirely agree with you that uh, we're being forced to make a terrible, terrible choice between, between uh, deaths and, and lives that, are, that can be destroyed in other ways. I, I take your point that the, uh, the costs of, of economic destruction could exceed in gravity. I think you said, you know, the costs of the, of the virus itself. How, but it's one thing to say we need to, we need to balance this and we need to remember that there are two sides to this equation. It's a harder question to say, how do, how do you make that balance? How, how do you think, I mean, you're clearly saying there's gonna be some death, we're gonna to have to learn to live with this virus, uh, but we know that we can, we can affect the balance by, by, by shifting various pieces of our policy. How do you begin to think about how we make those choices? Well, I think one point is that no philosopher king, whether New York or, or Washington, is going to have uh, all the right answers. I think we're actually a country that's well served by federalism, well served by localism, well served by trying to feel our way toward uh, uh, answers that work relatively locally. Just to give you an example, there have been more COVID deaths that we know of in Nassau County, an outlying county in, on, on Long Island with a population of about 1.4 million people, and there have been in the entire state of Texas. Uh, that probably has something to do with the fact that Nassau County sends a heck of a lot of commuters into New York City uh, on, on, on packed trains, and that becomes um, a, uh, vehicles for you know, so-called super, uh, super spreading, much more so than in Texas. So clearly what uh, ought to work in Nassau, the level of uh, seriousness or the severity of lockdowns that should work in a place like Nassau or New York City are not appropriate for New York. We also are going to have to feel our way in terms of uh, just trying to figure out how this disease is going to work. One of the points that I think needs to be stressed is that as serious as this uh, disease has been, the models that we saw and that we operated on early on in the crisis um, were way off. Uh, both the models uh, coming out of the UK, which uh, predicted uh, levels, fatality levels much higher than what we've seen, and some of those coming out here from the United States. I'm not saying, you know, these models are useless or everyone who's uh, uh, modeling is, is some kind of intellectual gangster. These are serious heuristic tools. They, they make a certain amount of sense. Uh, but we, there is no perfect knowledge. And so I think there's a case to be made that allowing a certain amount of freedom and experimentation is likelier to lead us to the kind of balanced outcomes that we need rather than one size fits all prescriptions. It made sense at the beginning of the crisis when we didn't know how grave it would be to have the kind of na near national lockdowns that we had. Today, I think the case for that, the argument for that is much weaker. Can I ask you to uh, talk a little bit about the protesters in Michigan and elsewhere. I, I'm particularly, I'm curious about the, uh, the confluence of gun rights groups, anti-vaxxers, 
Tea Party, Tea Partiers, uh, with the people calling for, for reopening the, uh, uh, the economy. And, and I'm just wondering why this issue, which it seems to me should be one of, of science and medicine and protecting people from economic uh, damage, is instead becoming an obvious left-right ideological issue. Whose fault is that and what does it mean? I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, <laughs> for the record, Nick, all my children are vaccinated, okay? I believe in science. Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm crazy. I, 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 uh, try to, I try to be sensible and I try to defer to the judgment of experts where, where such deference seems to make sense. But the COVID-19 crisis is not simply a crisis of public health. And so it's not simply one in which people who are experts in public health, epidemiologists, uh, medical specialists, and so on, they're not the only ones who should be weighing in here. Um, uh, there is a case to be made that if you live in uh, large, huge swathes of New, York, of New York State, where there is hardly a case of COVID-19 around, uh, the case for shutting down Home, home Depots and, and every uh, uh, coffee shop is a, fairly, is a fairly weak one. And so... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make. I don't want to concede to people whose politics are far more populist or radical than my own a point. But I am trying to say that they, even if we don't like a lot of what they believe, they are making a point that is felt by many people whose views are otherwise quite sensible and and balanced. And I don't want the case that I'm trying to make, this balanced approach, I, 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 I hate to see it being seized by, you know, some uh, distasteful people who happen to march on a, uh, on, on a state uh, uh, capital. That goes, by the way, uh, uh, in, 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 every, in every direction. I'm sure that uh, most of the left doesn't see its interests represented by the people who are saying 18 months of lockdown and the kind of Zika manual uh, approach to uh, a public health crisis in which there only seems to be uh, one problem in the world that has to be solved. Um, in, in, your, in your view back from 2025 column, you posed uh, this election scenario. You said Joe Biden would be hamstrung, can't leave his house to, com to campaign, the Democratic convention is canceled, Trump is, in, in control of the COVID response. He dominates the story. He's able to wield emergency powers to aid his reelection. And as a result, he will win handily in November. Is, yeah. that, something, is that something you actually believe? Is that something that's inevitable? Uh, well, as the guy who, who predicted the inevitable victory of Hillary Clinton, I'm, I'm going to now <laughs> boldly predict the inevitable victory of, of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, look, uh, the polls have him down, but the betting odds have him up. Uh, so uh, we'll see. But the president has, even though he's lost the argument that he was trying to make uh, for his reelection, which was the strength of the economy, that argument obviously no longer works on his behalf. He has powers of incumbency, which he could use uh, to, to his own benefit. And Joe Biden is stuck in his, uh, stuck in his basement. Right now, I don't think this is going to be an election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. This is going to be an election between Donald Trump and Donald Trump. Um, is the Trump that we are going to see emerge in these next uh, five or six months going to be uh, the Donald Trump of the uh, bleach prescription and uh, the UV light inside the body? Or is it going to be um, uh, a, a president who sort of warts and all conveys a sense of authority and uh, uh, direction. Um, and depending on which Donald Trump shows up on November 3rd, uh, we're gonna have a result. But right now, if I had to place a modest bet, I think he's going to be reelected. Does it even matter how he behaves? Is there, is there a case to be made that this election will be a referendum on Trump's handling of coronavirus? And that at the end of the day, the only thing that's really gonna matter to voters is, do I have a job? Do my neighbors and family have a job and how many people are dead, regardless yeah. of how much Trump bloviates about ultraviolet light or, or whatever, all that really matters is where we are on November 3rd. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, look, what matters isn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, whether people have 
a job, it's whether they feel they have uh, confidence that a second Trump administration is going to move in a direction that is going to make job creation more likely uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than less. Um, and if they feel they have that confidence, that is to say, if Trump talks about, you know, making sure that as many people as possible are being moved back to work, that we are providing uh, support for the middle class, that action is being taken to uh, punish China for its uh, role in uh, denying COVID and therefore helping it, uh, helping it spread, he's going to have a powerful case to make. Just for the record, I was asked by a conservative publication um, what Joe Biden has to do to make me vote for him, and my answer was breathe. Um, so my, for me, the vote is cast for, for a whole uh, uh, different set of reasons, but I'm just trying have to- Have you said that in print? Well, I said it to someone who I think published it, but I didn't, I didn't track it down whether it actually saw, saw print. Um, so just briefly, how would you grade Trump's performance so far during the crisis? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 is it at the standard of where the Titanic is on the floor of the Atlantic or where the Marianas Trench is on the, on the deep floors of, of the Pacific? I think it's, it is um, not just embarrassing, it's, it's horrifying. And I, by the way, I want to, like, let, let me give Trump this much. I think any president, would have been profoundly challenged by this particular uh, pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking that, uh, that takes place, but the truth is that a lot of experts were saying that it was unlikely that we would see uh, COVID spread to the United States, uh, that it would have the reach it did. I think any president or most administrations are typically taken by surprise by the weaknesses of their bureaucracies uh, in dealing with it. CDC got a lot of things wrong. FDA got a lot of things wrong. Big government is, is a beast that rarely works um, uh, effectively, particularly uh, in, uh, in emergencies. All that being said, the president had a responsibility to provide intellectual direction, uh, moral leadership, um, clarity, and transparency. And he failed on all of those counts, beginning with um, the nonstop denials of the seriousness of the crisis, then this war metaphor, which I think is uh, is the wrong metaphor for dealing with a pandemic. We are not at war with uh, a virus. Uh, we're not going to actually s succeed in uh, defeating it. Um, uh, and then, of course, the performances uh, from the stage. Uh, these are moments when the public requires a sense of trust in at least the intellectual capacity of its leadership to think through the problems, even if the answers are unclear. And I find it hard to believe that anyone watching Trump from, from the podium over these past few weeks thinks he has that capacity. So I'm getting lots of uh, questions on, on my phone from the audience, and I want to I wanna move to them. But I'm also being told, this is getting really gloomy. So I thought I'd ask you, uh, before we turn it over to, uh, to the audience, I mean, what? When you really try to flip it on its head and not be your usual Cassandra-like self, what, do you, what are the possible positive things that could come out of this? Well, look, let, let's be clear. We've, we've dealt with much worse as a species um, and as Americans. The bubonic plague uh, killed about a third of Europe, maybe more. Uh, uh, next to that, COVID is a it, next to that COVID is a relatively trivial crisis. Uh, the Spanish flu uh, of the misnamed Spanish flu of 1918 was far more devastating, and yet what followed from the Spanish flu was, you know, of course, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, so there is a possibility that instead of seeing this kind of hockey stick recovery, we might see a V, sharp decline followed by. Uh, uh, a sharp recovery. We are learning something about the importance of human connection. We are learning something about the importance of respecting uh, our uh, caring for our elders and uh, most vulnerable parts of uh, the population. Look, there are probably uh, cynical governments out there that will respond to the COVID crisis by saying, well, the people who are dying are mainly uh, elderly and uh, no longer of quote, social use, 
uh, and so we can afford to uh, neglect them. Uh, I suspect that's what's happening in China. That's why I have such a uh, such a hard time uh, uh, believing the numbers that they're they're putting out. We're not doing that. We are looking at our old and our infirm with renewed uh, a renewed sense of compassion, and we're showing what we are morally speaking as uh, as a country. And time and again, the United States has a way of making every mistake until we alight on great choices. We made every mistake on the eve of the Civil War, and yet we elected Abraham Lincoln. We made a lot of mistakes uh, in the 1930s, and yet we somehow came out of it as the strongest uh, and most confident democracy on earth. Uh, and what I hope uh, ha uh, is true historically, that pattern, I hope that holds up today. And one last question. You, you, wrote, you wrote a whole book about America's leadership role in the world. Uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the U.S., which has, which has taken a, a lead position in dealing with international crises, really, since the end of the Second World War, has not particularly uh, stepped forward and, and taken that role in this, in this crisis. In past, even public health crises like... Uh, uh, the Ebola crisis in 2014, uh, the AIDS crisis, the U.S. has really, has really taken a, a leadership position. Do you see an opportunity for the U.S. to, uh, to, to return to that uh, place on the stage? Do you think that's important? Yeah, it is important, and I see an opportunity under a different administration. Um, I think one of the great shames of this administration is that it, it doesn't even think to exercise that kind of uh, uh, leadership uh, on the global stage. We have truly entered a world of every country uh, for itself. And I think that that's the wrong response to what is obviously a, a global crisis. Look, there's a lot of learning to be done across the world, different models uh, uh, to follow um, and uh, resources to share. And I don't see any of that, uh, any of that happening. We are, we are a country that is um, rudderless and adrift. Uh, and uh, at just a moment when I think the need for American leadership uh, uh, has never been greater. So it's, it's one of the many reasons why um, I, I uh, Bill Maher once said that instead of greeting each other with handshakes, this is before COVID, that we should simply answer the question, how are you doing by hitting our head like that? <laughs> Uh, and that's sort of the way I feel about uh, our response to this particular crisis. All right, I'm going to read some uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, here's one. What are your thoughts on herd immunity as a way to deal with COVID? Well, I mean, look, again, I'm not an epidemiologist, but from what I know about it, herd immunity is ultimately uh, going to be essential, at least if COVID uh, it behaves in the way uh, of other uh, of other viruses. There's so much we don't know about this virus or the various mutations that might emerge uh, from from this virus. But it seems, and again, I'm speaking now very much non in a non-expert way, that one sensible approach to dealing with it is to uh, is a kind of a metered approach in which we actually encourage people who are least susceptible to fatal cases, that is to say the younger and healthier part of the population to uh, expose themselves to the virus, which is why I question the wisdom of some of the, some of the school lockdowns or efforts to keep uh, uh, children from, 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 from getting this. Obviously, I understand the ramifications. Children interact with vulnerable people, uh, elderly people, uh, uh, and so on. But to the extent that we can slowly move towards herd immunity, uh, uh, that makes sense. Again, we are feeling our way uh, in this, but at some point, most of us will have to be exposed to, uh, to the virus. And hopefully, whether that happens by way of uh, inoculation, ideally, or simply by way, by, by way of exposure, that seems to be essential for regaining public health. This is how, the, how, how humanity has dealt with viruses from time immemorial. Uh, here's another question. Someone asked that you uh, address the role of governors in this crisis, which I guess means both. Do you think there are governors who've done particularly well or particularly badly? And also, what does it mean to try to deal with a crisis like this 
uh, in a federal system where, where the federal government isn't, uh, isn't taking responsibility for everything. Well, I mean, look, this is why I think the system is that, that we have in the United States is, is, is a pretty good one in which governors are uh, accountable as, uh, as executives, which they make decisions which are not only politically popular, but which offer some kind of learning for the rest of the country. Uh, uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida was widely criticized for you know, allegedly a dilatory approach, uh, lackadaisical approach to the crisis, but Florida has had fewer deaths uh, than uh, I think Westchester County, or about as many deaths as, as Westchester County. This is a state of more than 20, uh, 20 million people. We can learn from that. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the way uh, your governor, uh, Governor Newsom, has acted has been in the interest of all Californians. California has actually gotten off relatively lightly, and I'm glad to see that he's now uh, conceding that there are some large areas, counties in California, that don't have to be under the same kind of lockdown regime that you know, uh, Los Angeles uh, has to be under. Um, but again, this is, this is part of uh, a necessary form of experimentation that contains, um, that, that leads us to a, a, a better way of dealing with the problem by seeing what works and what doesn't. What can be, what can be done to resuscitate the economy when this is done? And I, and I would, make part of that question, how, how bad do you think this is going to get? What's it going to take to get us back to a, to a reasonable standard of living? And are there going to be big changes that we're going to see in the future? Are we going to have a different kind of economy than we had in the past? Well, it's a great question. Um, look, there are a couple of things that I think would be uh, really uh, uh, very useful. Uh, there are all kinds of burdens of government that uh, only small business owners tend to be intimately familiar with that could be removed so that things, you know, licensing issues, uh, inspection issues could be turned into one-stop shopping for small business owners who are trying to get uh, <coughs> something going, either in reviving a business or, or starting a new one. You know, I'm, I'm politically on the right and I've you said earlier, I've stuck to my, uh, I've stuck to my uh, uh, principles. Um, I think the idea of cutting taxes on companies that are, are overburdened and are just trying to get started uh, makes, uh, makes, a great deal, uh, makes a great deal of sense. One thing I, I, I don't think is going to be possible is the fantasy that the federal government is going to be able to carry the weight of uh, American unemployment and uh, job creation uh, any uh, any further? We are burning through trillions of dollars uh, every uh, every month, and that is unsustainable. Um, so we need to rethink that model that uh, Uncle Sam can simply uh, hold uh, hold this economy on its back uh, 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 indefinitely. We need to provide some breathing space for for private capital to uh, create the economy that we had up until about two months ago, which, which was a, in many ways a very, very good economy. Do you, think the, uh, do you think the media, the press is fair to Donald Trump? I mean, we watch him at these press conferences ranting and raving about the fake media and saying he's, he's not getting a fair shake, but do you think he has a legitimate underlying argument that he's being mistreated? Uh, look, I, I think um, I, I don't think the press is always wise in the way that it deals with Donald Trump, um, which is to say that unwittingly it plays his game, um, and unwittingly it allows itself to be goaded, uh, sometimes quite deliberately by him, by his every uh, tweet storm uh, or. Uh, outrage of the day. Uh, you know, Stalin said that the death of one man is a tragedy, but the death of a million is a statistic. You know, every Trump lie is an outrage, but after a million lies, it's hard to remember what the guy said uh, that was so outrageous just the day before. And so we've become a little bit, I think the press has unwittingly participated in inuring the public to the kind of uh, decline uh, and degradation of presidential standards that have that have taken place. Is the press unfair to him uh, occasionally? Yeah, I think there is a kind of a knee-jerk uh, reflex 
to criticize each and everything that not only that he does, but that his administration does. But again, that gives him, that often gives him an opportunity to score some easy goals. And I would say, last thing, um, I don't think the press has fully internalized the extent to which uh, we misled ourselves or were taken down a garden path on the question of the Russia investigation. Uh, that was a serious investigation. There was a lot of smoke there, but it turned out that there was a lot less fire. And I don't think we have kind of um, applied the deep scrutiny to our, uh, to the stories that we ran that we did, for instance, when it came to it, WMD in Iraq and, uh, and those past mistakes by the press. So the press is not fake. It, is, it consists of honorable people doing, I think, the best they can by and large. Um, but we've gotten some things wrong and we are uh, capable of uh, uh, arrogance and self-deception. And we owe it to ourselves, you know, you and me, Nick, as, as stewards of this, um, to do the best job we can to be as, as fair to those, particularly those to whom we are inclined not to be fair. Here's a question from the audience. How would you advise Biden to conduct his campaign from now till November? Uh, well, get out of his basement for, uh, for one thing. Uh, look, Biden cannot simply present himself as the guy who's not Trump, not crazy, and uh, who uh, used to work for Barack Obama. All right, that is, that is, the, uh, that is a George H.W. Bush uh, uh, a, a, a approach to presenting himself, or maybe the Walter Mondale approach. I'm thinking of former uh, former vice presidents. I don't think that's enough. I think Biden. I don't think we need a new deal in this country. We need new think, capital capital T. Uh, so really deep new thinking about just what a Biden presidency could offer and a return to normalcy, which I guess was the Warren Harding standard. I don't think it's gonna be a, a good enough uh, rallying cry. I think it's important that he uh, nominate or he select a vice presidential candidate who conveys um, experience and sturdiness and soundness um, and who uh, middle America is going to be uh, comfortable with. So that to me rules out Elizabeth Warren, Stacey Abrams, uh, a few others. Uh, but it's also important that there be some kind of intellectual heart, some promise to what Biden's about other than, you know, I'm not half bad. Uh, that's not going to do it. Um, what, is to, what is to stop Trump from taking on more power, power with the help of McConnell and Barr? To which uh, I would add, um, you know, do you think that uh, Trump will do things uh, that are untoward or illegal or to seize power or to cancel the election or, I mean, you said in your piece that he would wield emergency powers to aid his re-election. What, how, how low would he sink? Well, uh, I don't know. I think that question that almost sounds rhetorical, Nick, uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty low. Look, I, the one scenario I don't think is plausible is a scenario in which he clearly loses the election and refuses to leave power. Um, I think that's unthinkable, uh, uh, unthinkable for him, unthinkable for the Republican Party, unthinkable for the United States, and certainly unthinkable for the patriots in the United States military. I don't think that could, uh, that could uh, ever happen. But I fear scenarios in which you have, say, uh, a 2000, uh, you know, uh, election 2000 type situation in which uh, everything sort of uh, hangs by a hanging chad, so to speak, uh, for those who remember that episode. And there I really do worry about the misuse of presidential power in pursuit of, uh, uh, in pursuit of an illegitimate second term. Legitimacy is gonna be very important in this, uh, in this next election. And, uh, and we, it's not too soon to start worrying about it. Here's a good question. Is there any future for a real conservative party? Well, look, uh, one of the reasons why uh, I think I take it in the neck from every direction is uh, um, I, I've stuck to my conservative principles. I believe in smaller government, lower taxes, a strong defense, uh, an America that uh, serves as a moral beacon, uh, uh, an armed moral beacon uh, for, 
freedom-loving people everywhere. Um, and, uh, and I'm simply not prepared to go along with uh, Trump's uh, protectionist, restrictionist, uh, quasi-isolationist, uh, America first version of conservatism. I think every healthy society, every healthy democracy needs a morally healthy conservative movement and party. I'm sure there are many people on this call who are liberals and have never voted Republican, but they're probably deep in their hearts grateful for people like George H.W. Bush or Ronald Reagan, who even if they disagreed on so many policy grounds, understood that these were conservatives who spoke to the best conservative values about um, um, quality, openness, and freedom. And it's very important that American conservatism not be reduced to a kind of uh, uh, bigoted nativism. So I've tried to offer in my columns a version of conservative thinking that is clearly not left-wing, uh, not a kind of warmed over uh, moderate progressivism, that stands up for old fashioned conservative uh, principles, but is uh, absolutely distinguished from uh, what we now have uh, in, 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 in the White House. There's a great scene in the movie Gladiator where Maximus says, you know, uh, there was a dream that was Rome and this is not it. Well, there was a dream that was a conservative movement and this ain't it. <coughs> Well, I think that's much as I don't want to see a more conservative United States, much as I don't want to put too many more Republicans uh, back in power at the moment, I think that's a reasonably uplifting place to, to leave our discussion. Uh, I think David Lara is going to come, on, come back on, but I, I wanted to thank you, Brett. I thought that was really interesting, really fun. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, and I'm honored that you agreed to moderate this. David, back to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Brent. It has been a fascinating discussion. I think it just demonstrates our commitment to diverse opinions and uh, a, a good contest of ideas back and forth and uh, a free interchange. Uh, tonight, you saw our commitment to that, those concepts. Next Wednesday, May 13th, we will have, as it's mentioned before, uh, Congressman Adam, Sch Adam Schiff making his return engagement with our Community Conversation Series and he will be interviewed by Warren Olney of uh, radio station KCRW. Just as today, the program will begin at five o'clock and it will then be broadcast on KCRW in the days following. I'm also pleased to announce that our stellar lineup, which is probably unparalleled, will now include New York Times columnist and uh, Brett Stevens colleague, David Brooks. He'll be with us on Wednesday, June 3rd. Finally, all of you who registered will receive an offer of a free 30-day subscription from our co-sponsor, The Forward Newspaper, uh, and you will get the email tomorrow morning. I want to thank Brett, Nick, Zev, and Janice Kamenoresnik, with whom it has been a pleasure to work, for making tonight happen, and thank you all for taking the time to join us. We are grateful. Be well, stay safe, good evening.